your prayers as well. Of course, Donna had her back. Uh, the, have you ever heard of the nerves being burnt off your back? If you have back pain, she had that done in Sioux Falls this last week. And it seemed to be very helpful for her, but they can grow back. Your nerves can come back, and you have to get it done again after like six months or something like that. Mm-hmm. So just uh, keep them in your prayers. And Shirley Berry's got a bunch of things going on in her, in her family with her <coughs> sister and a son that's taken place. You can see them uh, in the prayer notes as well. And also it reminds us of Madeline, that would be the great-granddaughter of, of Norma. Uh, got a little, just a little note, this is Thursday, so it's kind of old news, but it gives you a little bit of an idea what this two-year-old girl is going through, as well as with her whole family and those that know them. Uh, she, she had chemo that started at 9 o'clock, this is on Thursday, so this is like four days ago. And... Uh, it says here, this is written, is there her dad? Is it David? So he wrote this, and he said, the drug for the first three days is the one that can cause nausea. So she can feel like throwing up. And then the next three days, she will receive two drugs each day, one of which is excreted through the skin and can cause her skin to break down rapidly if it is not washed off regularly. And so anyone who holds her also then has to be, have to be careful, well, they have to wash too, and they have to wear gloves and all kinds of things, type of thing for her. And, uh, and he writes this, he said, uh, it's, it's hard to think about a chemical that can be so damaging to our body as being pumped directly into Madeline's jugular vein above her heart. And this will happen multiple times with multiple drugs for hours this week. So you can only about imagine what this little gal's going through and those that are there with her. her she's lost her hair once and her eyelashes, and, and she'll end up losing them again, losing her hair and her eyelashes too. So uh, they, are, they have a very deep faith, and they're trusting the Lord in all this. And if you want to keep in touch with the family, they've got, they're on Caring Bridge, and you can get on there. And if you want to read more that's in here, you can ask me and I'll give it to you. You can sure read it for yourself. So that's something to also be mindful of with, uh, with Madeline. I just want you to know that the church council, those of you that are on the church council, we're moving it up a week just because otherwise it would be on Valentine's Day the 14th. So it's going to be on the 7th of February. And uh, we're going to meet at 7 o'clock that Tuesday night. And then uh, you'd still need some help there with the community table there. Lisa? Yes. We could still have some bars and cookies. And then the night that, on the 9th of February, on that Thursday night, um, we need to, I think we need to set up some things and, you know, take down, you know, tables or chairs or something. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Servers and things like that. So we'll need people there mm-hmm. on the grounds, too. So if you're, if you're able to be involved with the community table, see Lisa today. Let her know that you will be there. Or you will be square. You know what they used to say? All right. All right, let's just have a word of prayer together. And uh, looks like the ladies had a good time at El, Mar- El Mariachi, at having some Mexican food there. And uh, glad that you could be part of that. It's open up to all ladies that want to just get together and get to know one another. It's also good, too. Let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we come and we praise you this morning for... Mark and Tammy being here, Lord, uh, who, who could say that you do not hear prayer? Who could say that you are a God that answers prayer? They are living proof. And uh, we are grateful for all. I mean, she's been through a lot, and so has Mark. But today, we can be able to see them. We can be able to touch them if they let us. But we just thank you for their presence here with us today. That they feel good enough, strong enough to be here. It's been a long haul. And uh, it's been a real roller coaster ride for them as as it is for a lot of these other requests that we've talked about here today as well. Lord, we bring them all before you. 
knowing that you are God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. There's nothing too small for you. There's nothing too big for you. You have a plan. We don't always know what that is. But we trust you and we come to you and we pray to you. Sometimes, Lord, we get to the point where we don't know even how to pray anymore or what to say. We've said it all. But I'm thankful you never get tired of us. And Lord, uh, continue to be with Jan and the loss of Dave. We thank you, Lord, for a grandson. Be a great grandson, I believe, right, Jan? Great grandson who's also named David. So if if you don't know what to call the Convey family, just say David. There's many of them. And we know that a lot of it is because of Dave and how he lived his life and the prayers that he gave and prayed for his family and grandkids and even the great grandkids. So use this time today, Lord, in opening up our hearts and opening our ears. We want to come closer to you. We want to hear your voice today in our lives and to change us where we need to be changed. Only you can do that as well. Thank you for the praise band and thank you for everyone that is here today and those that we can pray for that aren't here, those that are watching us on Zoom as well, wherever they may be. May your blessing be upon them as well as all of us here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your love and kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? When heart and hand of such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory To wear my sin and bear my shame The cross has spoken, I am forgiven The King of kings calls me Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who sets me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name.
and seal the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is a of reading today comes from Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock and my refuge. Trust in Him at all times. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. One thing God has spoken, two things have I heard. That you, O God, are strong, and that you, O Lord, are loving. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life, I'm in awe of you, I'm in awe of you, where your love ran red, and my sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you. Sin and shame are far away. My heart has peace with God and forgiveness. Where all the love I've ever found sounds like a flood comes flowing. 
at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my skin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. Here, my hope is found. Here, on holy ground, here I bow down, here I bow down, here, arms open wide, here, you save my life, here I bow down, here I bow down, at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life, I'm in awe of you. sin washed white I owe all to you 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 Jesus Your love and red Your love Thank you so much for leading us in worship. Thank you, Bob, for picking out the songs today. I invite you to stand as we hear God's word this morning. It's in Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 27. Luke chapter 2. 21 through 27. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that is before us today. And uh, some of these things, Lord, that we may not relate to very well, but hopefully after hearing this message today, it'll make a lot more sense and even make us be in awe of what takes place here. And so, Lord, uh, use this time in speaking to hearts, and for drawing us closer to yourself. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's interesting that Matthew doesn't say anything about this, but we have to go to the historian, Dr. Luke. And he tells us what happens just eight days after Jesus is born. There is some laws and rules that needed to be taken care of because God gave them back to Abraham way back in Genesis. Abraham was was called Abram 
God changed his name, saying from here on, your name is going to be Abraham. And he said, and your descendants, I'm going to make a covenant with all your descendants. And the sign would be that the firstborn son, the male son, would be circumcised on the eighth day. And that's kind of how it all begins. And so we get into the time of Jesus' birth. It takes us into the New Testament. It takes us thousands of years to get there. We find that this is still being practiced by all Jews. Joseph and Mary are, are Jews. And uh, here we find eight days after Jesus is born, we take him to Jerusalem. And there's different things that go along with a birth of a firstborn son. I want to share them with you this morning. In Leviticus, it tells us what these are. And Leviticus is in the Old Testament. But it says that on the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Now, do you know what that means to be circumcised? Look it up. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but this is something that God said is going to be a sign. All Jewish boys would be circumcised on the eighth day. Doesn't, you know, doesn't say anything about the daughters. There's nothing there for daughters, but for the boys. And this is the first time where we see that Jesus is going to suffer for us in circumcision. If you think about it, very personal, very intimate. God could have picked some other way, but this is what he chose to set his people apart from the rest of the nations that were around them. You often hear in the Old Testament and sometimes in the New Testament that uh, those who are not God's people, are referred to as the uncircumcised. Even David, when he went before Goliath, and Goliath came out every day to, to just challenge the Israelites, and uh, David was the only one that went out with his slingshot and five stones, and, and uh, he said, you know, you uncircumcised Philistine, I'm coming to you with God's strength and God's power, and he swung that slingshot and hit him right, hit Goliath right between the eyes with that stone, and down he went. And so there's a real difference here of God's people, one of the signs, one of his covenants with his people was the male would be circumcised on the eighth day. It's a difference. There's a difference there. Some of it can be hygiene as well. So when you think of that, to be circumcised, there would be a dedicated acknowledging that this boy belongs to God, that comes from the parents. They dedicate their son to be God's. They kind of dedicate him to, to the Lord. The second part of the ceremony is that there's redemption. One month after his birth, the firstborn son was, um, well, that's where the dedication comes in. Circumcision itself is a sign that you are in a Jewish covenant with God. Redemption is your dedicated acknowledging that you belong to God. And then there would be a sacrificial offering was given at that time. And then the third ceremony is the purification of the woman. The mother who gave birth, she was considered unclean. If she had a daughter, for a first son it was 40 days, she was considered unclean. If she had a daughter, it would be 80 days, she was considered unclean. But there was also another sacrifice that was offered on her behalf for the cleansing process. And this is all that Joseph and Mary went through. And we find that Joseph and Mary gave you know, it was either two pigeons or it was birds. Two, two pigeons or two doves that would tell them, that tells us that they were poor. 
They could not afford to buy a lamb, but here they have the lamb with them. The lamb of Jesus, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, right in their arms. But they're too poor to, to buy a lamb. And so they sacrifice two doves or two pigeons. So uh, what would happen, let me ask you this, what would happen if a Jewish mom and dad would take their firstborn son and have him circumcised before the eighth day or after the eighth day? You know, could, could they do that? Well, if they did, they would not be following God's laws. And therefore, it would, this was a way in which on the eighth day, they would become into the family of God. They would become a child of God through that s- circumcision. It was a spiritual thing that's going on here. It wasn't just something that you did. There was a lot more to it than that was a real it was a real uh, practical thing to, to do in telling God that this is our child. We thank you for him. We praise you for him. But now we give him to you because we want you to work in his life as well as if you have a daughter, work in her life. But in God's view, if he was not circumcised on the eighth day, then he would not become a part of the Jewish race. He could not be a Jew. So it had to be done very meticulously that the eighth day was important. If you did it before, you did it afterwards, in God's sight, it would not count. He would not then become a child of God. He would not become a Jew because you did not follow through with what God had said. And God is a holy God. God is very particular, very, very, um, everything he does, there's a purpose and a reason behind it. If you look at how the tabernacle was built, or even the temple, there were certain things that had to be done. When Noah was given the measurements of the ark and what he needed to do to get that ark built, it was very, very meticulously and he's to follow each and every one of those rules. God is a perfect God. God is a holy God. And so here at the circumcision, Joseph and Mary follow it to the T. And it is on this day of circumcision that you actually are give, you give the name. The parents give the name to the son. And so his name will be what? Jesus. Now, it wouldn't be Joe. It wouldn't be Jay. It had to be Jesus. Just like Zechariah and Elizabeth, when they circumcised their son in their old age, who was John the Baptist, they said, you know, what are you going to name him? What's his name going to be? And she said, John. And Zechariah then said, John. He couldn't speak before that at all, remember? Remember? But when he could say John, and after he said John, they said, well, you don't have anybody in your relation, no relatives by that name. How can you call him John? They said his name will be John. And he turned out to be John the Baptist, a cousin to Jesus Christ. And the one who was the one who came before him as a prophet, Isaiah said, that uh, would take place that there would be one out in the wilderness who would cry out to make way for the, for the Messiah who was going to come. And the people were waiting for the Messiah. And it is John who says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world in, in reference to Jesus Christ. So this is a special day, the eighth day, for a Jewish couple. There was also someone there in the, in the temple courts that day that was also a special day for him. It was Simeon. And, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of going back to birth, but after his birth. Now we're in the temple in Jerusalem, and he, you got the Holy Spirit that is upon this man called Simeon. And so there's a mystery there. He, he was told somewhere along the way that he would not die until he saw 
the consolation of Israel, which is another name for the Messiah. They're expecting someone to come. And it's the Holy Spirit that leads him into the temple courts the same day that Joseph and Mary are there. And when he sees Jesus with his parents, he says, now I can die. He knows that Jesus is the one that they've been waiting for. We don't know how old he is. It doesn't say how old Simeon is. There's also someone else that is in the temple courts that day. We won't get into her, but she is an older woman. She's like 84, I believe. Is she 84? Yeah, we got in here somewhere. But she was married for seven years and then was a widow for all those years. And she went to pray every day in the temple courts. And she also saw Jesus. And said some wonderful things to Joseph and Mary after his birth. Just like they heard from the shepherds. And they heard what the, you know, were told what the angels had said. And then you got later on will come the, the magi from the east. And they give their gifts of gold and of frankincense and of myrrh to them. And then later on an angel in a dream tells Joseph it's time to get out of there. And go to Egypt. And so that's what takes place. So Luke, as we see his writings here in the second chapter of his gospel, he mentions that Simeon is a righteous and a devout man. And it was revealed to him that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And uh, here he sees, uh, he sees Jesus on the eighth day as they bring him as Every Jew is to bring their firstborn son or their son and to have him circumcised. So it's a very special day. And it's a day in which God makes a covenant with his own through this circumcision with, with Jesus, with any other Jewish male boy. And like I said before, it's a very personal one when you get into circumcision. It is... Uh, a way that God said, this is the way it's going to be, and I will take him to be one of my, my children on the eighth day through this covenant. I don't know if you know this or not, but in the seminary that I attended, circumcision is looking forward into the New Testament teachings of baptism. You get a little idea of, you know, infant baptism is in the scriptures. It's easier to kind of to uh, process and to believe adult immersion or adult baptism. But you can't say that the Bible does not speak to infant baptism. This is one of the things when I went to seminary, I said, you know, I got to find out if this is really true or not. Or how do you, how do you figure this all out? And so, uh, through my time there, I had to listen. To, oops, I had to listen, listen to a lot of the professors. I'm sorry, <laughs> I forget I had this on. I'd listen to a lot of the professors as they explained how you get infant baptism. And it's like God is concerned about even children. You know, if you say, "Well, there's an age of accountability." You know, that, that means there's a space in there. We don't know, but the Bible doesn't talk about an age of accountability. You don't find anywhere in there that talks about the age of accountability. But we do know that God loves every child, boy or girl. And he said that in order for anyone to get into the kingdom of heaven, you must be like what? A child, a little child. It doesn't say you must be like an adult. Or you have, to be, you have to know enough to be able to do things. But he just says you, you need to be like a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I know there's a lot of controversy with when you get into baptism. And there's been a lot of fighting over that for centuries before. I'm just saying that this is what has been very helpful for me. When it comes to looking at the Bible and looking at what is said there about baptism. So, it, it, so it's like... When 
in a, especially in a, in a Lutheran setting, we know that we baptize infants. And uh, there's some who say, well, it doesn't mean anything. To Lutherans, it's like, well, this is when God accepts you as a child, become a child of, of God. The problem that happens oftentimes is Lutherans, sometimes when do they baptize their little baby? It can be months later. Why do Lutherans wait so long? When, when, if you're Lutheran, and Martin Luther believed in baptizing a child soon after they're born, why do Lutherans today wait so long? I don't know. They have their reasons sometimes. But baptism is important. And uh, it's just the beginning. It's not the end. It's the beginning. There needs to be nurturing and teaching that takes place in this child that the mom and dad are to give to that child and the other people in the family do as well. That the child grows up to hear about Jesus Christ and what he's done for him or her. Where they then come to that faith where they go like, I want to follow Jesus. I understand what he did for me. He died on the cross in my place. And that's why I love him like I do. There are some that have, have been baptized and they said, you know, there never has been a time in my life where I felt away from God. He's always been there for me. And so they never had any kind of a, an experience of, a, of going forward and giving their heart to Christ or dedicating themselves to the Lord type of thing. They said, God's always been with me. So you have, you have people like that that come from backgrounds like that as well. So the main thing is that that God does something. It's a mystery that we don't always understand everything that goes with it. But he know, we know that he cares for, for babies. He cares for little children. Um, it's not a ritual or a ceremony to go through and just forget about it. Growing up as a Lutheran guy, saw many baptisms. And at the same time as watching some of these kids grow up, the parents really didn't care where they would be spiritually as their days and years went by. Sometimes the parents themselves had been baptized and really didn't care about their spiritual lives either. We find that in later, later the Apostle Paul even says, as he talks about what took place in his life, he mentions that he was circumcised on the eighth day. It meant something. It was important to have done. But he's showing that he is a true Jew. It also, we go further into the New Testament, you find that circumcision changes from an act that is done in the ceremony to what becomes more important is a circumcision of one's heart. You can have a hard heart, and you need to have it cut and peeled away so you have a soft heart towards the things of God. You can be like a rock, but God wants a, a heart of flesh that he can work in and on. Does it sound like you today? What kind of a heart do you have? Forget about the circumcision aspect of things, but looking at your heart today, is your heart really with God or is it against God? Because even a Jew can go through all the ceremonies, all the things that go along with circumcision, and still not live the Jewish life, even though they've been circumcised. And that was something that was talked about by the Apostle Paul in Romans, chapter 2. So that can also happen in the world of infant baptism as well. And uh, 
I know it's not a popular thing to talk about, but I believe it needs to be said that baptism, you need to be nurtured in what has gone on there and to hear what Jesus has done for you. That's why church is important, bringing your kids to church. It's to be with other believers. It's to hear the things that the Bible talks about. Or if you come questions, you know, it gets, it gets good conversation as well. But oftentimes, even when we were baptized as children, we can go through then confirmation instruction. And even though you've been baptized and confirmed, you still cannot have a relationship with Jesus Christ or with God. You go through all the motions. You go, everybody said it's important, but once you've been confirmed, you're on your own. I've heard that. It shouldn't be that way. It should be, hey, let's just continue on learning about the Lord in our lives together. We know that there are no signs of a living faith with Jesus Christ with someone when they die. And uh, you have probably heard a pastor say or tried to preach them into heaven. This doesn't work that way. Circumcision was special. It was a special day. So is baptism a special day. Anytime we get to see Jesus and know him personally, it's a special day. There's no such thing as eternal security or universal salvation. You know, some say, well, Jesus died on the cross for everybody, so we're all saved. That's universal salvation. Or eternal security is that you've been, been baptized, so now you know you're going to heaven. It's, 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 you're secure in that. I don't believe the Bible teaches either one of those. But I do want to close with this story. There was a brother of, of a deceased who told the pastor. So you got the brother who died and then a brother who's alive. He talks to the pastor who's going to have the funeral. And he said to him, I'll give you $1,000 if you use the word saint in relationship to my brother who just died. The pastor kind of shakes his head and goes like, what are you talking about? He said, I want you to be able to say that my brother was a saint. Now everybody knew that this guy who died sure was not a saint. And so the pastor thought about this man's offer and he told him that he would see what he could do. So during the funeral service, the pastor said, you all know that this man here in the casket has never attended church in his life. He was a swindler, he was a cheater, he was an adulterer, and he was also known as a town drunk. But comparing him to his brother, he was a saint. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may today be that special day where we know that Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. I do not have to worry about God's law like Joseph and Mary did, but they wanted to. But today, Lord, when we come and to believe in you, it's by faith. It's not by something that we do to gain something from you. It's just simply we believe in Jesus. It's by faith. Because you're a God of grace who's done everything for us. It's just for us to believe in what you have done for me personally. 
And so, Lord, it is so simple that sometimes it's, we make it so hard. Thank you that we can live for you this day by faith. Help us not to chase rabbits that say like, well, baptism should be this way or that way and there's only one way it should be done type of a thing, yada, 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 yada. But do I know Jesus as my Savior today? That's what's important. So Lord, as your Holy Spirit worked in the temple courts with Simeon, we know that you are at work here in this sanctuary Speak in the hearts of those that are here today. And Lord, you take us just the way we are. Just as I am, without one plea. It is you who saves us. It is you who gives us that assurance that we need not to fear death but that you're a God of life and we can spend eternity with you. So let us pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not in a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I just think of one thing. The, the, one of the thieves on the cross, remember him? He said to Jesus, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be in paradise. He didn't get baptized. But he's got the promise of God to go by. So let's stand and recite as we recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord just just show his love to you and his grace to you in ways that only he can. We say this in his precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Bob. shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you there'll be shouts of God and all the trees of the field will clap their their hands and all the trees of the field will clap their hands the fields of Just stand as we go through it again. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you. There'll be towns of joy and all the trees of the field will clap. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. 
Shall go out to withdraw. 